So a bagpipe player was hired to play at a funeral in western Kentucky, and he got lost on his way to the viewing, right? He gets lost, and he finally ends up at this place, and he sees a bunch of workers who are sitting on a tractor, some in a pickup truck, and he thinks, oh, man, am I too late? Did I miss out? Oh, my gosh, and he's overwhelmed, but, you know, he made this commitment. So he gets out his bagpipes, and he stands on the edge of the dirt so that the workers could see him, and he starts playing Amazing Grace. Well, these workers, you know, they wanted to be respectful, so they kind of come off of their feet, and they stand over, and they pay attention to the bagpipe player. And the bagpipe player plays all four verses as the workers take their hats off and, you know, in politeness and whatnot, and the bagpipe player, the bagpipe player finishes and solemnly walks off. And as he walks off, the workers, or he overhears one of the workers say, man, in all my years of putting septic tanks in, no one's thanked me by playing Amazing Grace. I know, bad joke, but. Well, my name is Kyle. I'm the youth minister here. If you're here and uh, well, thank you. If you're not well, as Toby said, please go home. Uh, but if you're new here, in front of you, in the chair in front of you, will be a connection card. Please fill that out and put that in the basket on your way out in the foyer. So here's what we're going to do today. I need a little bit of crowd participation. I'm going to put some words up on the screen. should be above average, average, and below average. We're going to talk about school. I love school. I'm passionate about school. But how many of you would say that you're above average. When you look back at school, you're like, yeah, I was above average. Very few of you look around at all our nerds, right? How many of you were just average? You guys were BC students, you lived in that realm, okay, not a bit, not too much. And then how many of you were, let's just be honest, were below average? School just wasn't your thing, and that's okay. That's all right. For me, it all mattered about the subject. If I liked the subject, if I found it fascinating, math, history, I love that stuff. Science, not so much, right? Sorry. And interestingly, I heard a teacher once tell me that, Kyle, you're either going to lead people to jail or lead people to Jesus. Funny enough, the first few years of my life is exactly that. The first few years, I was leading people to, G uh, leading people to jail, and now these last few years, I'm trying to kind of balance it out. Before I came to work at Severn, I was a teaching aide. I love students. I love teaching. And one of the greatest things about teaching is when you give someone a test and they don't know any of the answers. That complete look of defeat. Okay, but anyhow, one of my favorite feelings is that. And so over the years, I collected a bunch of funny things about school, and the great thing about students who don't know the answer to things, they'll just pull it out of somewhere. They'll figure it out, and they'll just jot down any answer. And so I put above some of my favorite images or some of my favorite collections. What ended in 1896, 1895. <laughs> Right? If you guys want someone creative, you want to hire someone with creative solutions, this is your guy. Here's the next one. What is the cause and effect? Tony practices the piano 20 minutes a day. Effect? He's a big nerd. <laughs> right. This third one is my favorite of all time. This kid missed every word except the word illiterate. <laughs> now, if he was in my class, A. Immediately. I'd give it to him. So today we're going to talk about modern myths. We're going to talk about modern myths that we all kind of dangerously tend to tiptoe around and eventually believe in. Our myth today is follow your heart. Follow your heart. Seems innocent, right? But our leader, our teacher, Jesus, had some very profound things to say about those who are his students. We're going to be in Matthew 7, specifically verses 24 and 27, through 27. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, I put it right above in the NASB. All right, starting from verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. 27. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So essentially, Jesus is saying when it comes to building our lives and finding the proper foundation, we have two options. We can build our life on truth, or we can build our lives on lies. If we build our life on truth, and the storms of life come, and they will come, we'll better weather those storms. If we build our lives on the foundation of lies and the storms come, we're going to have a difficult time wading through that. You may know the name Rabbi Zacharias, Rabbi, Rabbi. 
Zacharias, famous Christian thinker, author, and speaker. He was invited to speak at a major university in our country recently, and an engineering student picked him up from the airport. And he was the host for the day, drove him around campus and all, and walked him into the auditorium where Zacharias was going to be giving his speech. And immediately the student said, Dr. Zacharias, this is the first postmodern building ever built in the United States. He said, some of the hallways lead you nowhere. Some of the staircases take you nowhere. Unimpressed, Dr. Zacharias said, do you think the builders did the same thing with the foundation? You know this, right? Some of you who have lived just a little bit, you either build your life on God's truth or on Satan's lies. And scripture uses very clear metaphors to describe the two parts. When we build our lives on God's truth, we're going to follow a light. If we build our lives on Satan's truth, we're going to live in darkness. Now, if we follow the light, it's going to lead us to greater levels of life. If we follow the darkness, it's going to lead us to greater levels of death. So in other words, if you follow your heart, you're going to end up on this side of things, where the Satan category is. Now, Jesus, Jesus continues to extrapolate and unpack the, teaching, the teachings in even greater detail. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 12 real quick, where Jesus says Satan is like a dragon, which is the metaphor that Jesus uses to describe him. The dragon gives birth to two beasts, and Jesus said beast number one, false religion. Beast number two, corrupt government. Now, Satan can lead one person astray easily, but you know what he likes to do? Satan likes to lead millions of people astray at once. And historically, the way he's done that is through false religions and corrupt governments. And the way he has weaponized false religions and corrupt governments are with the terms that we call relativism and humanism. Now let me unpack the first one, relativism. This is the framework of thinking where people begin to believe that there is no absolute standard of truth. It's all up to the individual to define, and let's evaluate that. How many of you, I'm curious, have ever been at a stoplight in your car and have a sudden panic attack because you think you're rolling? And you slam on the brakes, and you look over, and you, and you try to make sure and look at your neighbor, and you're like, all right, they're rolling, right? And you realize it was them. Well, the way you realize it's them and not you is if there's a fixed, immovable object like a building nearby that you can gaze to. Let me illustrate that another way. We know that this line is crooked. This line is crooked because we have a straight line to compare it to. In other words, all of us are agreeing to operate by a standard, and that standard is fixed, and it helps us identify other things related to it. We do the same thing in mathematics. If I say 2 plus 2 equals, you should have an immediate answer that comes to your mind. Your answer is what? 4. But folks in relativistic culture agree with this premise. If we embrace that there's no absolute truth or absolute standard of truth, if I say the answer to this question is 16, you can't disagree with me. And as, a matter of, as at, uh, and as a matter of fact, you'll be labeled a bigot if you do. So here's the first problem with relativism. Truth, truth is exclusive by its nature. Two opposing ideas cannot both be right. For example, this is my right hand. This is my left hand. Can you imagine the chaos that would ensue if after church today I decide to drive on what everyone considers not to be the right side of the road? In the same way, Christianity and Islam are not teaching the same thing. They are teaching very different paths leading to who and what they claim to be God. Both cannot be right at the same time. So truth is not only exclusive by its nature, but truth is also potentially offensive, especially in a culture that has elevated tolerance above every other virtue. And what we're seeing right now in our country is an an all-out onslaught war that started in the 60s between facts and feelings. And unfortunately, for future generations, feelings are winning. One author describes the tension point this way. She said, The notion that there are many truths might seem well-suited to a diverse society, but when everyone is free to define truth as he or she prefers at, as present, the result is an intellectual moral shouting, moral shouting match in which the loudest voices are most likely to be heard. I have a picture of three people. All right, these three people right above these three people, are professors at a university in the state of Oregon. Each of them has a PhD in their respective fields, very intelligent people. But as professors, over the last 10 years, they've noticed that there's a war between fact and feelings. And feelings are winning that war, so much so that they decided to do an academic experiment. 
They wrote together 20 research papers based on bogus information and fake data and statistics. They got 16 out of their 20 research papers published into academic journals and articles, in which other students at the collegiate level and teachers quote and use as if they were factual. One of their studies they did was on how all men in the United States are inherently evil and toxic, and they backed it up by quoting a study that they did on the rape culture of dogs in public parks in Portland. Now, these, these three are not Christians. They don't necessarily believe in God, but I definitely give them a standing ovation because what they're doing is they're pulling the curtain back and revealing to us the systemic threat that relativism, that relativism is in any civilization. A man named Peter Singer is arguably the most recognized philosopher of our day. He's a professor of ethics at Princeton University. And what's fascinating about this man is that he's a professor of ethics, yet he believes in infanticide, which is, the, which is that the killing of children is morally justifiable. He's a modern-day Nietzsche. He has extrapolated the teachings of Darwin in his book, The Descent of Man, where he talks about propping up feeble people through vaccines and other related practices. Further, Singer says parents should have the right to destroy a baby prior to birth or even after birth if they want. Now, is that extreme? Absolutely. The question is, is it being put into play? And the answer is yes. In the state of New York today, his teachings have effective legislation. Two-thirds of all pregnancies in the state of New York don't make it. Only one-third of children in New York are born and taken into a loving family. That's where we're at. Now, let's look at the other side of this, right? There's a woman named Harriet Johnson, and she is part of an activist group called Not Dead Yet. She's a lawyer. She practices in Charleston, South Carolina, and she's in her mid-50s. And as you can tell, she probably weighs around 70 to 80 pounds. But don't look at that and translate that to weakness. This is a very strong, intellectual woman. And she proved that in a series of op-ed articles that she wrote in the New York Times entitled The Case for My Life, whereby she debated, dismantled, and destroyed Peter Singer's ideology. One of her articles, she made a statement that really stood out to me. She said, it's not that I'm ugly, it's just that most people don't know how to look at me. And here's my question for you, not collectively, but individually. Do you think that woman, Harriet, do you think that woman has a right to live? Do you think her parents had a right to terminate the pregnancy prior to and even after she was delivered? How you answer that tips all kinds of moral dominoes that will affect the future generations to come. And I think Jesus was onto something. I'm convinced historically that false religions always get into the bed with corrupt governments. And it starts with relativism, the deconstruction of truth whereby a society begins to believe and say out loud, there is no God. That's a slippery slope that leads to humanism, whereby the next declaration is there is no God because we are gods, or we are all our God. In other words, I'll follow my heart and my truth, you follow your heart and your truth, and we'll just all live happily ever after. Sounds good, but here's where it begins to break down. This is a picture, a picture, a wedding of relativism and, hum and humanism. See, we're okay with Darwinism and Nietzsche being and even Singer stuff being taught in the classroom. What we're not okay with is when it's actually and pragmatically lived out. This is a picture of a stronger people group making a decision to protect the weaker, or decision not to protect the weaker people group, but to systemically and systematically destroy them. And if you believe in relativism, you, if you say there is no standard for truth, then you cannot disagree or you cannot argue with Hitler's logic. Friends, he's just following his heart. He's defined truth as he wants it to be defined. You can't argue with school shootings or even mass murders like we saw in New Zealand because those people confused, angry, whatever their emotion, they're just expressing it. They're following their hearts. Al-Qaeda... ISIS, Taliban, every time they behead someone or, God forbid, rape someone, they're just following their heart. In other words, what happens when we deconstruct truth is someone else gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. So let me arm you with something I think you need in your head and your heart. And I call that the moral hierarchy of authority, and I use it a lot with our students. I'll give you a real-life example of how this works. In Los Angeles, a gang member killed a teenage boy outside of a public high school because this young man supposedly looked at this gang member's sister disrespectfully in the hallway. So the gang member reached the conclusion, you disrespect my sister, I take your life. That is his code of ethic. 
That is how he behaves, and that is how he functions. Now, the problem is it is in conflict with the laws of Los Angeles, also in conflict with the higher laws of the state of California, also in conflict with the higher laws of the entire country, the United States. Now, the way our judicial system works, he'll get convicted, go to jail, and he'll make an appeal. And if he gets there, it, will all, it could also end up at the Supreme Court, and they eventually get to decide his fate. Here's what I find fascinating. Long before we ever existed as a country historically, humanity has always said murder is wrong. It's not okay to take another person's life. And why is that? Because historically, humanity has always recognized that there is a supreme authority, even, even behind the, beyond the highest court and the highest judges in all of the land. Why? Because humanity has recognized that there are physical laws that govern this universe. Science proves that. Science also proves that there are moral laws that govern this universe. And, there is, and if there is any standard of truth, there has to logically be a source for that truth. And the way I say it is, design always points to a designer. If there is a law, there must be a lawgiver. And the way I like to illustrate that is with a wristwatch. And if I were to hold up this wristwatch and take it apart to pop off the back casing, pull apart all the dials and mechanisms and little intricacies of this wristwatch and lay them on a table, you would reach the conclusion that someone intelligent designed this. Some skilled worker put this thing together, right? What you wouldn't do is reach a conclusion that metal hundreds of feet, be hundreds of feet below our feet decided to pop up, partner with the height of a cow, and become this beautiful wristwatch. Because that's ludicrous, right? How much more ludicrous is it to look at something far more complex than a wristwatch, the human body, and say that design was not involved? See, friends, there is a standard for truth, and there is a source for that truth. And of all the options that are available to you, can I humbly suggest that Jesus is the best option? The same Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Now let's notice two things about this truth. Number one, this truth is highly exclusive. Number two, this truth is potentially highly offensive to a lot of different people. But before you get there to the offensive part, I just want to ask this question, is it true? Because that's what matters. Is he really the only way, the only source of truth, and the only source of life? And the only way to get to God is through him. Are these true statements or questions? Because if that's true, personally, I don't want to follow my heart. I want to lead my heart to him and follow him. I went to a Bible college in Missouri, and my professors were stellar. College plug. But my professors were stellar. They invited us over. And if you know any secret to my heart, it's through food. And these professors 100% gave me food all the time, and it was fantastic. I actually surpassed the freshman 15. I was like the freshman 50. But I digress. They taught at the collegiate level, which also meant that they also lived at the constant intersection of faith and feelings, and they saw them collide on a daily basis. One thing I remember my Old Testament professor saying was, kids, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. Which, if you haven't heard, it's very good advice that I've taken to heart. During my time in college, I was exposed to all sorts of philosophies and ideologies from my peers, and I started wrestling, like all of us do, with huge questions. Who am I? What is my purpose? Where did I come from? Is there a God? If there is a God, is he loving or vindictive? And if there is a supreme authority as God, what's my responsibility in the grand picture? So on and so forth, right? But I was a sponge. I read everything that I could get my hands on. I listened to ideas. I sat in the front row for lectures, debates, and all kinds of discussions. And I'm glad I did, because I took it all in, and I had the options in front of me before making my decisions. Well, one day at college, I met this guy named Chase. He would say that he didn't want to step on, others, on anyone's toes, that there are so many facets, so many paths of truth for different people, and he didn't want to make anyone's path or anyone's truth any less true. And I can remember him in my philosophy class expanding on the premise that the world would be so much better if everyone followed their truth. If you follow your truth, and I follow my truth, the world could be better. And that's an interesting conclusion, but I struggle with it. And I wrestled with it because, personally, I want definitive answers. I don't want relative answers. I don't want relativism. And, the more that I, and I find that the more that I neglect definitive answers, the more that I struggle. And I don't know about you, but the more I seek definitive answers or a definitive standard of truth, the more clear my life gets. 
Speaking of my philosophy class, I took this year-long philosophy course my junior year of college, had this brilliant professor, he read like three books a day. His concluding statement at the end of this year-long philosophy class was, philosophy generates few answers and a lot of questions. It's like a blindfolded ma blind man in a basement at midnight looking for a black cat that doesn't exist. <laughs> philosophy is a blindfolded blind man in a basement at midnight looking for a black cat that doesn't exist. I paid thousands of dollars for it. <laughs> and that's what I got. Here's a picture of the SS Monroe steamship. It sank in 1914 because the captain knowingly had a compass that was two degrees off the standard magnetic compass of that day. 41 people lost their lives because the captain was stubborn and refused to calibrate his compass to true north. And the same thing could happen to people like you and people like me. And I don't want that to happen. Jesus said, if you don't align your life with truth, you're going to end up in situations that are, with people that are dangerous. And the darkness will be more than you can handle. He's right. I've been there, and I love you enough to put this filter up on the screen and just say, will you use this? Will you recognize that God is the standard of all truth? He's the universe's light, and he is true north. And you want to align your faith, your fears, your family, your friendships, your finances, your future, and so many other things with him in a factual way and not just a feelings-based way. Because if you don't, you could deviate from his path and you'll end up in dangerous, dark places that always lead to emotional, physical, and spiritual death. And I love you too much for that to happen to you. So let me say this. Ultimately, the reason you don't want to follow your heart, the reason you want to lead your heart is because love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. The Bible teaches that love is the perfect balance between grace and truth. And the way that I like to illustrate that is with a rubber band. I couldn't find any bigger rubber bands around the church, so this is a rubber band. The rubber band, right, finds its purpose in tension. A rubber band finds its power in tension. And the same is true for truth. Truth by itself has never helped anyone. In addition, grace by itself has never helped anyone. If I was driving to the church in the dark and my car broke down and I pulled over on the side of the, rope and I, or the, side of the road and I popped the hood up and I had a flashlight in this hand and a wrench in this hand, the flashlight would reveal the problem. But I need the wrench to fix the problem. And in the same way, I've got a sin sickness in my life and I need God's truth to help me identify what's wrong but I also need God's grace to fix that problem. And sadly, some of you have grown up in churches where they didn't manage the tension between grace and truth very well. And so you just accumulated this, a massive ball of confusion about who God is and what he wants for your life. And I'm here to tell you, if all you heard in your church was angry amounts of truth, you know what you walked away with? You walked away with an understanding of how awful your sin was. And that translated to, how awful you are. And you never were given the grace to properly heal. And I'm sorry for that. Others of you grew up in churches where all they preached was grace, and so your sinful lifestyle was never confronted and crucified. And today you live more like the world lives than what God wants for you. See, friends, our world doesn't need less truth and less grace. It needs the perfect tension, the perfect balance between grace and truth, which is ultimately God's agape love for us. We don't need less of that. We need more. And you might say that sounds a little extreme. Well, I know where it begins, and I also know where it ends. And we've seen this historically. Let me give you an example. There is a soldier that fought in World War II where truth was being deconstructed. And he is going to articulate to you why he became a follower of Jesus and a minister. He said this, A buddy and I were assigned to one boxcar inside the concentration camp known as Dachau. Inside the boxcar were human bodies stacked in neat rows exactly like firewood. Most were corpses, but a few still had a faint pulse. The Germans, ever meticulous, had planned the rows, alternating the head and the feet, and accommodating different body sizes and shapes. Our job was like moving furniture. We would pick up each body so light, carry it to a designated area. I spent two hours in a boxcar. Two hours for me included every known emotion. Rage, pity, shame, revulsion, every negative emotion I could say. They came in waves, all but rage. Rage stayed, fueling my work. Then a fellow soldier named Chuck agreed to escort 12 Nazi SS soldiers in front of Dachau into an interrogation room nearby. A few minutes later, the crew working in the boxcar heard two big bursts of machine gun fire. Soon, Chuck came strolling out alone, smoke still curling from the tip of his weapon. 
They all tried to run away, he said with a grin on his face. And that's when it got to me. On that day, I felt called by God to become a minister. First, there was, a hor- there was the horror of the corpses in the boxcar. I could not absorb such a scene. I didn't even know such absolute evil existed. But when I saw it, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I must spend my life serving whatever opposed such evil. Then came the incident with Chuck. I had a nauseating fear that the captain might call him, call him to escort me and the group of Nazi soldiers, and an even more dreaded fear that if I did, I might do the same thing that Chuck did. You see, friends, the beast that was within those Nazi guards are also within me and also within you. And that's why I'm going to end with this. That's why Jesus, in love, said this to us. In Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27, These words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you are like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them in your life, You were like a stupid carpenter who built his house on the sandy beach. When a storm rolled in and the waves came up, it collapsed like a house of cards. In other words, friends, don't follow your hearts. Choose to lead your hearts to Jesus and follow him. Let's pray.